Esther Phillips Clark, children's author, educator, angel card reader. Um, welcome to Nature of Reality Radio. Pleasure having you on. This it was a wonderful thing for you doing that angel card reading for me at that event um, at the uh, Exitari Center, I believe it was, um, by that um, Michelle Bunting who uh, channels Abraham Hicks, who was also on my show. She um, hosted that event, and uh, I learned a lot from that event. Had a great time at that event. Uh, had did yoga for the first time in a while at that event too. That was memorable. Um, so it's a pleasure having you on. Just a cl couple quick uh, disclaimers before I give you the chance to tell your life story here. Um, folks, it's uh, great to be doing shows regularly again. Gone through a lot in the past uh, month and a half or so with uh, having to quit my job that I've been working at as a clerk in my recently retired mother's ophthalmology office for 15 years. I wanted to be the administrator at that job someday, but those hopes were eventually dashed when I was forced to quit that job by December 8th deadline because I refused the dreaded shot that they're forcing everybody at the office to get because they're giving into the mandate that says if all healthcare facility workers don't have um, the shot, by December 8th, we lose our Medicare funding. So they would have no choice but to to fire me if I um, didn't get the shot because I refused the shot. So and they would lose their money. That's uh, <laughs> the way it goes in these terrible times. Hopefully they will change soon. And uh, so I got a job at Whole Foods now. It's a kind of a dream come true because I got a 20% discount there and I only get food from there. And first day of dishwashing, it kind of brought back memories of Bert, Wendy, Wendy's and Burger King, <laughs> washing dishes in the back there. Um, and I, I think they like me. Uh, I seem to have uh, helped out immensely on my first day. So, and I did have one first day blunder walking into the girl's bathroom instead of the boy's bathroom by accident, but it was my first day, so sue me. And I can hear you laughing, Esther, so uh, let's all look back and laugh and say it was my first day, so cut me a break. But anyhow, um, the uh, great to have you on, and um, why don't you uh, now tell your uh, life story uh, regarding who you are and what you experience that caused you to do the stuff that you do. Uh, and then we'll get into some really nitty gritty serious questions about angel card readings, unicorns, and anything else that's um, that you can enlighten and elaborate on. But first, we want to know about you. Tell us who you are and what you experience that causes you to do the stuff that you do, Esther. You've got the floor. Oh, well, thank you, Andrew. I uh, really do appreciate this time with you and sharing uh, my story. Um, I am an, a local author here in Morristown, New Jersey. Uh, I'm a spiritual guide or teacher, and I um, am a practitioner of angelic energetics. I offer angel card readings and these angelic energetics healing sessions at the Xtari Wellness Center in Medford, New Jersey, as well as um, in other areas um, I can go to a sanctuary in New Jersey as well as in people's homes. And uh, the messages I interpret are transmissions of energy that come from the angelic realm. Uh, they offer adults and children a gentle way to connect with their angels and their guides and divine light beings. Uh, I guess I... I actually started in 2008 um, training for um, this particular uh, profession with Kathy Milano, who is an, an intuitive, and she's also an artist, a psychologist, and the creator of Angelic Energetics at the Soul Sanctuary in Morristown, New Jersey. I also enjoy courses um, that just Mary Law facilitated from her, um, Shine is her meditations company, and she's a medium, an energy healer. She's also a practitioner for angelic energetics and a beautiful creative artist. So after uh, 30 years as a reading and writing educator, I had written uh, a book when I was in college, a story actually, and then became the first book. Now I have four books. Uh, they're all um, in the Winelda series. I call it the Wish Book series. And the books are, um, had earned a gold medal from Mom's Choice 
Awards, which I was very thrilled since it was during the Summer Olympics of 2016. The first book got the award, and then in 2018, the second book got the Gold Medal Award. Uh, it also uh, uh, received awards from the Creative Child Magazine as being the best book for kids, uh, and that was in 2018 again. So what I've done is I created a company to kind of be the umbrella for all my different um, things I do with my angelic work and my writing. And the company is called Unicorn Tales because it highlights the magic of storytelling and um, it's for all ages, even though the stories are children focused. Uh, I visit schools. I go to libraries and local organizations reading the story. I present the message of the book in the story that your dreams and wishes do come true. So that's the main thread of all the books. And um, it can make a real positive difference um, just if you listen to your heart. And that's the message I would like all children and all people of all ages to know that you just need to believe in your passion and what you do and just keep believing. It may not happen right away, but eventually it will come to you. So the books also support a very dear organization of mine in Haiti. It's called Love Orphanage and it's in Croix du Bouquet and part of the funds from the sale of the books go to educate there's about 21 children in the orphanage and feed the uh, children from ages 3 to 17. And the original children in the orphanage were orphaned from the 2010 earthquake. So it's been in operation um, now for at least 11, 11 years. So I live here, as I said, in Morristown, New Jersey. I have a, a wonderful husband who supports me. He's my vice president. <laughs> and I'm so grateful to have had this opportunity to be here today and um, look forward to whatever exciting adventures are in store for me. <laughs> so well, that's basically it, Andrew. Did you have any questions for me? Well, I guess um, getting to the... Uh children's author thing uh writing uh children's books always seems to bring out the imagination in you even if it's a a short story it's kind of um always fun to read um and uh noticing the uh prices here down on the uh books here you got two for 16.99 and two for 4.99 those 4.99 ones those are um are they actual books or are they just uh um it's Winnell's Wonderful World to Color. Is that to, to color? color? Yes. Uh, yeah. So that's uh -huh, a color. They book. are what I call activity books. Yes. yes. Okay. Winnell's Wonderful World to Color. And the other is Winnell's uh, Book of Facts and Fun. So um, the story books are hardcover books, and they're all in rhyme, and they are um, picture books that are actually done with acrylic. So um, they're a little more, you know, expensive because of that. And then the I created the activity book, so it could meet the needs of as a tool to the parents to connect the children with the literature, and it extends the theme of that particular story. So the first story, which is her first wish, was a wish that she is very different. She doesn't fit in, and she wants to belong. So she makes a wish, and she waits and waits and waits for her wish to come true. And finally, on a Halloween night, her wish came true. And so the activity book then highlights beginning reading skills for children, but there's puzzles, there's compare and contrast. There's, like, you have to find the bat without the eyebrows. You have to find a spider on every page. So that helps with differentiation, which is a beginning skill children need to know to learn their alphabet. And then you have um, higher level skills, such as plot, character traits, 
writing a sentence, using your imagination and drawing a picture of uh, putting a spell on something. And then spell is also how do you spell your words. So there's scrambled words which you have to spell out perfectly. <laughs> so that's the difference. One's a soft cover activity book, the four ninety nine, and then the hardcover storybook. Um, the second book, Andrew, is the Thanksgiving story, which is perfect for this week since we're coming up to Thanksgiving next Thursday. And um, that story is about her gratitude for getting her wish. She was so happy on the 31st of October. On November 1st, she came back saying, thank you, thank you, I got my wish, and magic happened. So in this story, her uncle takes her back in time to the first Thanksgiving, and she sees the pilgrims arriving on the shores of the New World, and um, the Wampanoag indigenous peoples was the tribe that greeted them, and if it weren't for the help of those indigenous peoples, they would not have survived. Uh, so um, the activity book then is a little higher level than the first one. It's for ages, I would say, 5 to 12. And it incorporates all the different facts of the Wampanoag tribe, their way of life, their language, their words. We got words from the Wampanoag, such as skunk and pumpkin were actually Wampanoag words. And then they have um, how to do a thank you note and how to make a gratitude journal, different activities. But there's also a trivia game they can play at Thanksgiving, and the children can make up questions and see who knows the answers about this Thanksgiving. When was the Macy's Parade developed, or who made Thanksgiving a national holiday, and uh, things like that, just to make it fun to learn. Now, uh, since you mentioned that, I can't resist pointing out that I remember our Akashic Records reader, Andrew Barsis, once saying that one of the uh, many things about our past history that's kind of misleading was the story of the first Thanksgiving. It was actually a lot more uh, confrontation and a little bit of more violence going on around that rather than the go along uh, to get along um, mentality that we kind of see between the pilgrims and the Native Americans. It really wasn't all hunky dory. It was um, kind of a little more unpleasant than that, but I'm sure that you could not put, uh, even if you were aware of that, you could not possibly put that in a children's book. It has children's to be a little book. more yeah. peaceful. Yes, I researched. Uh, it thoroughly um, and did after that first year there was a confrontation and that's why it never happened again um, there there were many different aspects that came into play with uh, the uh, tribe and they actually heard gunshots going off and um, the tribesmen came upon the Plymouth Plantation or, or the, the Plymouth Plantation people heard these shots, but it was the um, indigenous peoples using their guns to shoot the uh, turkeys that they and wildlife and deer because <laughs> they were learning to use their guns, and they thought the pilgrims thought they were using it on them. So there was a miscommunication in that interpretation, and um, they settled that up, and that's why then they they got together and had the feast because they killed all these animals and they had to cook them <laughs> and eat them <laughs> or preserve them for the winter. And that's how the feast actually came about. So, um, and then after that, it, things fell apart, so to speak. But. Oh, so you are somewhat aware of that. Okay. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I see the color you've chosen for, um, Winella the witch um, for well the uh, hat is a uh, purple with uh, some mm -hmm. yellow stars uh, that's uh, purple seems to be a common color for wizards hats which well this is a witch we're talking about not a not a wizard um, but I see you've got her wearing a uh, pink uh, is there any divine feminine um, aspect to that and was the um, the color purple chosen for the hat and also the cape that she appears to be wearing if there's if that's cape. Uh, that's um, purple seems to be a common um, magic color. Was that taken into account? Yeah. You, yes. 
Good for you, Andrew. I, I'm really surprised that you picked up on that. That's great. Um, yes, there is there. Um, the colors do represent um, every in, in and in my training with the angelic uh, rays of light. Each color has a particular vibration, and um, purple is a vibration of royalty, and it comes on as a higher level. Um, it's actually uh, the top of the ray of the rays so it's your um, intuition your intelligence it's linked into the mind but also how to interpret words and uh, feelings so that uh, what is one of my favorite colors too the deep blue and um, the blue is the ray of Michael the Archangel and faith the Archaea and um, that's the protector. So um, he's the one that comes in and right in the right hand of God, and he's watching over um, all of us. So uh, the blue hat indicates that protection. And the pink cat in the story, the first story, she actually is a character in the character traits of defining who she is. She's kind. She's loves to dance, she likes to read, she likes to learn, she's fun, she plays fun tricks, not nasty tricks. And she um, actually found this little pink cat because all the other um, friends wanted the black cats, not the pink ones, and it was different, like she was different. So she took it in, nourished it, brought it back to life, so to speak, and um, now carries the cat under her hat. So she has a little home there, um, so to speak. But um, the colors are are really important in the book. And it's the pastel colors, and they pop. Um, Christine Donahue was the illustrator of the stories, and we worked together. The other aspect of the story um, was the house. My original story was written in 1971 as I was enrolled in a creative child literature class. I was told for my assignment to write a short story for children and at the same time I was student teaching a fourth grade in Huntington, Pennsylvania, Juniata College. It was where I was attending and graduated from. So I um, thought, well, I could not find any stories about Halloween in the library or wherever I went, and nothing on their level. So I said, well, I have to write a story. I'll write one to explain Halloween and why we trick-or-treat, because they were wanting to know that. And um, that's what my story tells. It tells how we've come to trick-or-treat and the um, uh, haunted house was the main character in the first story. Now we're going to zip into the 2000s. After I retired, I took the book down off the shelf. I thought I might work on this and see if I could do anything with it. So in 2012, when I retired from my, um, my job teaching, I looked for an editor and sent my manuscripts for three years to different publishing companies. And finally, in 2015, Brown Books in Dallas, Texas, said, we like your script, we want to pick it up. So I said, oh, great. So I started working with them. And the first book came out in 2016. But I had to take that 16-page story and add another 10 pages to that story. Because all picture books have to be 28 pages long. Who knew? <laughs> I learned a lot in, in learning how to publish books. So um, the next step was I had to create my main character, and they told me to develop Winelda. Not the house, but Winelda. And um, I had to take my pictures and find an, an illustrator that had uh, background in uh, the fine arts, and I was I was a dabbler in arts, so my pictures really weren't published worthy for picture books. So 
So Christine did agree to help me, and we worked on that, and she did a great job for me, and uh, we got the book out in 2016, and then she helped me again on the book for 2018. So that's kind of how the story came to how the books became published. Thank you, thank you. Yep. Um, and uh, as regarding the uh, the subject of uh, witches, uh, this is a good witch, not like the Wicked Witch of the West from the Wizard of Oz. Completely different there. And uh, people hear witchcraft, they uh, they often mm -hmm. sometimes think of the Salem witch trials, where witches are getting prosecuted in a communist style uh, act of um, takeover, like we yeah. like what you're doing. So we're going to hang you or bring you at the stake or whatever it is that they did to those. Uh, those poor ladies who were just trying to have a little metaphysical fun. I'm sure it's well, all it was. We're <laughs> just trying to have a little metaphysical fun, and this is the way you treat us. Unbelievable. It's um, I know. but but this but is true. But uh, I was uh, I'm gonna I was actually uh, thinking myself about um, uh, having some metaphysical fun. I've actually got a couple of spell books um, over the last few years, and um, been working with a couple um, spells. One where you take a uh, green candle. Um, and uh, wash your face while the candle is burning by the sink before you go to bed at night, wishing for all the bad luck to go away while reciting some incantation. Another one that I've been doing involves folding towels while having a picture that someone someone actually drew this for me uh, for a small fee, a picture of what my soulmate would look like, putting that next to the towels, folding the towels while imagining that the, there's a, my heart or the soulmate's heart in the towel, and the towel is mm -hmm. you or your soulmate rub, rubbing your hands or your arms around the, a person, hu like hugging them in the heart, and you recite some incantation to recite, to, to find your soulmate and all that. These are more basic ones, but there's other ones in the spell books that I haven't gotten to yet that involve, um, like, going to intersections and finding some trinkets and doing, reciting some incantation at the intersection or uh, some charm casting things. I could go on and on, but um, I, I, I was got some advice from uh, Sean Margaret Cohen, a psychic medium, my first ever guest on my show. I'm saying got to be careful with these spells, um, do the wrong thing, and even if you're not trying to do black magic, as they call it, it may turn into black magic if you're not careful. Mm -hmm. Well, do you know anything about, uh, uh, can you give me any advice, I should say, advice regarding doing spell work and how to make sure that you don't create black magic when you didn't intend to? Oh, okay, Andrew, yes. Um, well, I don't... Um, no, I don't have a lot of knowledge of the black magic. I, I just know from my own life experience and learning how to manifest love into the world because that, I feel, is the positivity of the magic. And, um, yes, there is the dark side and the light side. So I focus on the light. And um, the light will make balance with the dark. And as you um, want to make a change in your life or you're looking for a, um, like a soulmate or you have a wish or dream in your heart that you want to see manifested into the world, um, it's important to do some of that um, visioning, which is what, this spell book is telling you to do to vision and then look at the things that you can see in this reality and um, make that vision so you can do a vision board uh, if you you know all the things you find that are compatible for someone you would like to have in your life and you put every single thing on that board and then you Instead of an incantation, you just say a prayer or you say uh, an affirmation about this. This is going to be coming into my life. I am going to see this person who um, has these qualities and likes to do um, things I like to do or can enjoys gardening and or whatever the um, things you're looking for, um, so to speak, and then how to overcome obstacles. And I think the one main thing I've learned through um, my, 
growing up and living this life is the stillness is where you can find the answers. If you can be still and know that you are more than what your body is. You have a light that's inside your heart, so to speak, and you go inside, you sit still, and you just focus on that soul that you have inside. And when you know and listen to how you feel inside when you're with somebody or you get a contraction when you, you're with another person that is just, this is not going well for you. You'll feel it. You just listen to your body. Listen to what how you're feeling. Um, is your body tingling or are your palms getting sweaty? Things it will it will tell you. Your body will tell you exactly what is going on with your your feelings. And then you have to look at that and say, okay, what's my choice? Everybody has a choice. We have our free will. You can choose to stay in that kind of feeling if that's what you want, or you can choose to change it. And the only one you can change is you. You cannot change anyone else in the world but you. And um, that is a, a, a lot of people think they can change somebody else or they can change the situation. Um, but there is a power greater than us that is life and life um is beautiful the energy of life is is a miracle it really is i think we need to look at each individual as a speck of god it's just a little piece of god and every animal every living thing is a speck that weaves together what this life is. So your choices that you make will then affect the next person and the next person and the next person. And um, it's like a little domino effect, I guess, if you think of it that way. But Winelda is, her message is to be you. Just be you in the world. Bring your light into the world bring your gift of who you are and it doesn't matter if you're you know autistic or you have no legs you were born with uh, half half an arm or you you are so smart that people can't even figure out what you're trying to do so uh each one of us has that gift to bring to this life, and um, we need to treasure that. Yes, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the thing about every person being a speck of God, well, everything is a speck of God, because, um, right. I mean, everything is infinite consciousness, and um, every mm -hmm. small part has all the information of the universe in them, because every small part of the hologram is a representation of the greater hologram but that's um well maybe get into some mm -hmm. of that a little bit later but um uh, actually um I, at this point i need to say um listeners at this point in the interview i would like to ask nicely please consider paying me on patreon for a subscription to be able to listen to the rest of this interview as well as the rest of all the other interviews um that i will probably be doing from this point onward um uh, the uh, short abridged versions will be available for everybody on YouTube. Um, they'll have the word short version in parentheses after them and the uh, unabridged uh, long versions um, only accessible through Patreon subscribers. All the short versions also are uploaded to cost.tv, by the way, in case the um, day may come where I get kicked off YouTube. It's amazing. I haven't been kicked off YouTube with all the uh, stuff I try to talk about and expose on my show. But... Um, Cost on TV is where I prefer people listen to my interviews. Um, listen on YouTube for 15 seconds just for the sake of giving me a view credit, please, because those view credits do help. And um, then listen to the rest of the interview on cost.tv. The link will be provided in the YouTube video description. 
Um, but again, um, I encourage people, please pay me on Patreon to listen to the interviews in their entirety. We do cover a lot of great stuff in these um, programs, and I don't do two-hour shows anymore. Though That was costing me the opportunity to get a big audience because humans, unfortunately, have lousy attention spans. So I decided an hour is probably the best way to go. So um, I can go maybe for another 20, 25 minutes with you in this interview. 